Hey Thomas. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna have to bring you up to speak. You should see an invite now. Can you test yep. your audio? Got it. Okay, awesome. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yep. Awesome. Um, let's give a few more minutes for people to load in. Uh, we're still waiting for Nevin too, and then we can uh, get started. I'm Perfect. testing it out today. We have the, we've installed this bot on the channel that allows us to record the session um, through that bot. So it's the first time we're testing it out. We'll see if it works. Our progression is Discord experts. It is strange that Discord doesn't allow you to natively record meetings or like uh, stages. They outsource feature development to uh, <laughs> the community. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Nevin, I'm going to invite you to speak, and then if you accept that one, there you go. Test that. Test your audio again, Nevin. Uh, testing. Yeah, yeah, it works. It works. All right. Um, people are still I, I loading. Just... What's that, Thomas? I say Nevin. You might have to swap the headphones. All right, we'll do. All right. Um, I think we can start. People are loading in, but um, oh, let me actually trigger the uh, the recording button, and then and then we can go ahead and get started. One second. There we go. All right. Uh, thanks everyone for being here um, in today's uh, session. Um, we're going to discuss uh, the future of uh, the Reserve Protocol after the uh, after launch on Ethereum mainnet. Um, since we're getting pretty close, we wanted to take a moment and share our ideas with the uh, with the broader community for what the plans are after uh, launch. And so that's why um, we've brought on uh, we have Thomas, who's our head of platform. We have Soham, who is uh, um, responsible for business development on the R token side, and we have Nevin, who is CEO of Reserve. Um, I wanted to start, since we haven't really introduced uh, Soham um, officially to the community uh, since he recently joined, I wanted to kind of start with an intro. So uh, Soham, could you please uh, tell us how you got to Reserve and introduce you to the community and, uh, and tell us what you will be focusing on uh, here at Reserve? Yeah, absolutely. Sinatra, thanks so much for the for the intro there. Hello to all the community members. I'm I'm super super excited to be uh, you know joining the uh, reserve team. Um, just an absolutely awesome project and honor to work with everyone here. Um, in terms of my background, so I started uh, kind of in traditional finance. I was on Wall Street as a, you know in sales and trading, which I did for a couple of years. Um, really didn't. Um, you know, I, I learned a lot there, but really didn't, uh, you know, think that that was kind of my future, right? I always wanted to go kind of more into the tech industry and things like that. And so I found myself actually, um, after a little bit, uh, moving over to the fintech side. I spent a few years in fintech, mostly focused on growth strategy and partnerships. And, uh, you know, during that time, uh, over the last few years, I've also gotten very much into crypto and DeFi specifically. And uh, so when I was introduced to Thomas and, and Nevin here at uh, Reserve, it was almost, uh, you know, for me, it was like my dream job, you know. Um, so I ended up joining here about a month ago, and I'll be focused predominantly on the business development and partnerships side of the uh, R token team, as Sinatra mentioned. So extremely excited to get started, very excited to, you know, uh, get to know you guys as a community. And so far, you know, you guys have been nothing but, but fantastic. So thank you guys so much. Thank you, Sam. Uh, and we're definitely going to dive into uh, some more details of what your role is going to be at Reserve. I guess that's ac actually the main topic of today. Um, yeah, uh, welcome to the team. We're very happy to, to have you. Thank you very uh, much. 
to all those all those details in a, in a few. Um, before, so the plan is we're going to dive into the into these details of uh, our plans for our token growth after launch. Uh, before we go there, I kind of want to set the stage with some um, some setting up questions, and I want to start with a question for Thomas. Um, kind of uh, taking a look at the future, Thomas. Um, if you look into, let's say, so right now the way I see it, the way that I think about this is right now we're we're kind of at the start of a new adventure because the product we've been building so far, um, we're ready to launch a protocol, we're almost ready to launch a protocol. And from then on, it's a new, a new, a new journey almost um, where we focus more on the growth of our tokens. Um, I kind of want to uh, know your, your vision or your thoughts, Thomas, about uh, what the future is going to look, look like uh, from now on. Um, and, and I kind of want to focus on the near future. So, Thomas, let's say, uh, let's take a look at the next year for the platform. Um, what would you consider a successful first year for the reserve protocol? Yeah, um, good one. So you know, I think number one, uh, a successful and safe launch. Um, you know, I, I, it's the biggest thing that we're focused on right now. And uh, we, I think as we've mentioned in a variety of different spots, um, you know, at, at this point, we're really focused on testing and working with our uh, various auditors uh, to make sure that our, all our T's are crossed and I's are dotted. Um, we actually just got back a audit report this morning from someone uh, from one of the firms that we're working with uh, that uh, that was uh, very encouraging, which is great. Um, and, you know, continuing to push on that. I think, um, you know, like post launch. At the end of the day, uh, uh, we're really excited to see what people launch, uh, what people deploy, what, ty what types of stable coins um, that have a variety of different um, yield and risk levels and you know, different creative ways of distributing the revenue to the insurance holders and the R token holders and um, uh, folks. Uh, so you know, I think uh, a, a successful um, couple months from now is that we've got a variety of great R tokens that are live uh, on the platform and that different folks are using for different things. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's always hard to set, uh, it's always hard to set goals. Um, but it's some numbers that we're floating around in terms of like what we're trying to hit is, you know, we, we want to get, we want to grow our TVL. Um, that, that at the end of the day will be the, the way that we, um, measure the growth of the, the platform. And so, you know, we, we're setting targets for six months from now and a year from now. Um, and hopefully those uh, continue to ramp up. So would you say so, Ham, that um, also from the from the perspective of the RSR holders, um, would you say that the main metric they um, should look at regarding R tokens is what you call TVL or, or more uh, or market cap of of R tokens? Is that the most is that the most important metric that defines success for the protocol? Uh, that's a good question. I don't think it's the most important metric because the nuance there is that we want to ensure that there are safe, you know, at the end of the day, our mission is to have a, um, a stable reserve currency uh, that is, you know, we actually, we don't really care what it's backed by as long as it's backed by things that allow people to um, save uh, and fight inflation safely. Um, and so, like, at the end of the day, that is the number one goal. Um, but in terms of uh, measuring the growth, uh, yeah, I, I think that TVL is the, the number that we'll be tracking frequently. Makes sense. Makes sense. Thank you. Um, Nevin, I wanted to kind of ask the if you have any extra comments here, because I can imagine, uh, I know how how you think about governance and how most of the rest of the team thinks about governance. So I, I might um, expect you to say, Obviously, market cap for our tokens is very important and maybe the most important thing. But I can imagine you also wanting to see evolvements in the in the government system in, systems in the in the coming year. Any thoughts on that, Nevin? Uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I I totally agree with Thomas that the the main north star metric is just going to be TVL in the short term. Um, and I think that that's important, you know, for the for the for the economics of the project overall, and also just for the momentum of the project overall. Like it's it's something that um, could bring like a lot more. It, it, it's not just that it would be like financially exciting for us or for other RSR holders, although it would be. 
Um, but it, it also could bring in a lot of like further resources to the project, further talent and attention and connections and so on um, to, you know, to end up being one of the high TVL projects. So uh, that's another reason why I think it is very important uh, for the long term trajectory. Um, but you're right, Jens, that I do think governance and, and progress in governance is uh, important as well. And that's kind of yeah important with this very long time frame in mind. Um, and so, as I think most people know, you know, we've started to collaborate with um, an external firm on governance research. Uh, they're named Bismarck Analysis. And that firm is really interesting because it, it's run by some friends of mine and they, um, they have this approach of uh, you know, they're basically a consulting firm. They they often work for like wealthy people um, to help them understand some very nuanced political situation um, or uh, or some particular person that they're doing business with. Um, but but these people are extremely intent on understanding governance, and they, and they've studied the entire history of governance throughout like the entire uh, uh, human civilizational period. Um, and so it's it's been really cool to start to work with them and to start to see some proposals for like how we could shift around the way that governance works uh, and and come up with like kind of a an additional system that our token deployers could choose to use. So that's a long-winded way of saying yes. Um, like I, what I'm hoping is that within the first year after launch, um, there like th that research effort ends up yielding sort of at least one new governance framework that's an alternative that we sort of open source and offer to anyone to use, maybe two versions, who knows. Um, uh, but you should expect to see in coming months like more and more discussion of the system ideas that um, that are being generated by that research effort. And then, uh, you know, we're also like, for example, at DevCon, excited to talk to um, a bunch of others in the governance space and see what ideas others are having and do that collaboratively because a lot of these systems can be applied to, you know, many different protocols like the, and so there's a lot of cross-pollination possible there. Awesome, interesting. I'm, I'm very excited to see what's, um, uh, what will appear uh, governance-wise. Governance um, Jack, I actually brought you on the stage. If you want to ask your question, I'll invite you to speak once more, just in case you wanted to ask your question, uh, um, because it was a really interesting one. It was related to, to the next topic that I wanted to discuss. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask your uh, question, Jack. I see you didn't uh, accept the invite. Um, it's related to, and, and Nevin, I wanted to ask you this question or um, ask you first and if other, others have comments to add. Um, before we dive into the, the details of our plans for our token growth, I kind of wanted to set the stage with, um, with a question that we often get in the community, which is uh, related to the market fit of our tokens. Um, a question or a remark that I often get is um, there's already quite a lot of stable coins out there. If you want centralized stable coins, you can use UZC or UZT or some others. And then if people want more decentralized version, they can use DAI or RAI. Um, you can argue about their decentralization, but um, let's assume that there are already quite a few stable coins out there on the market. Um, Nevin, I'd like to hear your thoughts on what do you think differentiates our tokens, because that's like Thomas has has said this a few times in recent events. Um, he said like the the main the main thing the main um, what's the word the main catalyst that will make our token TPL grow is the perfect market fit. Um, so could you speak a bit on that, uh, Nevin, and maybe Thomas, you can add on that uh, later. What differentiates our tokens from other stablecoins? Well, um. I guess I have a, a long-term answer and a short-term answer. Let me give them both. So um, when when I think about product market fit um, or or sort of the, the risk of not having it, um, I think that there can be, you know, w with any new product, you can have technology risk or you can have market risk or, or both. What, what that means is uh, if, if you just have technology risk and not market risk, that means that um, you have a product where you're pretty damn sure that people want that product. And then the question is technological, like, can you actually produce the product? Can you actually produce it at scale? Um, where you're pretty sure that, you know, if, if you did, then it would be fantastically popular, um, right? And so, like, often the, these are, well, anyway, so there's that. Then there's uh, the market risk situation where it's like, okay, we know we can make this thing. 
But we haven't really, like people haven't encountered a thing like this before. So we just don't really know, are people going to want this? Are they going to want this uh, on a large volume? The way I see it, um, stable currency as a general tool in the world obviously sort of has product market fit. Like stable currency is very valuable. People want their currency to be stable. That's pretty straightforward. Um, and so then in the long term, the way I think about the reserve protocol and, and the idea of creating stable non-fiat currency is that you know in the situation where fiat currencies continue to have challenges um, the way that they seem to inevitably have, um, there's a technological risk of like, well, can we produce or can the can the reserve protocol and and ensuing ecosystem produce stable currencies um, that outlast fiat currencies that don't have those issues? And if so, I personally am pretty confident that the world will want that. Um, and so it's it's a technological risk challenge in my book where it's like the the question of you know I, I often reduce it to can we get governance right and uh, and will enough assets be tokenized? Um, but there's maybe a further question there. You know, maybe a super diversified portfolio of assets with one-to-one -one redeemability doesn't quite work. We, maybe you need a little bit more nuance on top of that um, in order to in order to smooth out volatility in that portfolio, for example. And that could be a further technological advancement. So um, I see technological risk uh, for that for that long-term goal of creating stable non-fiat currencies. Now let's talk about the short term. Like immediately after launch. Obviously, we're not yet in a position with what's tokenized um, to start exploring, you know, totally dollar independent currencies. A lot of the tokens that exist in DeFi are dollar denominated. And so it's really more like, well, what can be built on this on top of this tech stack in the short term, even though we're still waiting for further um, uh, evolution in the ecosystem. And so in, in that sense. And I think this strikes more at the heart of your question, Jens. You know, it's like, well, there's a lot of stable coins out there. Why would this? Why would this be more interesting um, in, to any given user population? So, I do think that the the universe of basically wrapped DeFi uh, baskets, where 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 you can explore sort of anything that exists in DeFi and wrap it together in a basket, um, and then offer insurance and active governance on top of it. I personally think that's pretty interesting. Um, but like we don't know how people will respond to that. We don't know exactly what people will build with that, and we don't know how the market will respond to that. Um, one thing that I think a lot of people miss that that excites me and makes me think that this product could be um, really killer is that if the governance is done properly, if it is sufficiently decentralized, then you could have a wrapped basket uh, uh, token that is not a security from the US legal perspective. And that's actually pretty important because um, you know, there are many interesting yield bearing assets in DeFi um, and, and there are, there are uh, assets that are backed by baskets um, in DeFi already. But if you look closely at them, uh, in, in my opinion, many of them are securities from a US legal perspective. And that makes it so that you know, a Coinbase or a Binance or other um, you know, reputable exchanges, centralized exchanges, or, or wallets, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, modern fintech uh, companies that have started to list crypto assets like Venmo or Cash App, et cetera, they're not going to list those because they're securities. And so there's possibly this sweet spot where you could have um, asset backed stable coins, you know, basket backed stable coins that are yield bearing, uh, that do have like a, 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 an active management component, but where that management is sufficiently decentralized. That it's um, that that the the resulting token is not a security, and thus it could end up being listed much more broadly and accessible to many more people. Now, will that happen? I don't know, right? I, I'm not in control of all of those exchanges and wallets and so on. Um, but that was that was one of the ideas um, that we that we uh, sort of embedded in our design process was to aim for uh, a governance. Uh, system that would be clearly sufficiently decentralized, so that we'd be outside of that securities designation, um, and that's one thing that very you know that I'm excited about, and, and we'll see if that ends up working. Um, you know, to, to get a sort of shorter term product market fit for yield bearing stable coins. I think the other the other key thing um, to touch on the last part of the original question in terms of product market fit and uh, launch partners. Um, one of the things that we've been hearing quite a bit, um, Nevin touched on this, 
is the insurance, right? Like at the end of the day, there are a lot of stable coins. There's been a lot of um, craziness in the stable coin world, uh, specifically over the last couple of months. And, you know, I think that one thing that is, uh, we've gotten a lot of really good feedback on is that people are excited about this insurance. That is like a decentralized insurance uh, that no matter where the token is held, whether that token's held on a hardware wallet and a MetaMask, um, with a third party custodian in an app, you know, whatever that is, um, that insurance kicks in and handles it all behind the scenes on chain. And that's something that's really interesting uh, to folks. Um, and no other stable coins out there that I'm aware of. If, if anyone knows of one, please tell me. I'd love to learn more about it. Um, no, no one else has that feature yet. And uh, so, yeah, that, that, that is one thing in particular that we've got a lot of great feedback on. It's to thing to that... piggyback off that as well, sorry to, to interrupt, to piggyback off ahead, that. Um, the way I like to think about it in terms of the main differentiating factors, it comes down to risk mitigation, right? No one wants their soul coins, whatever stable coin they hold, to just have the risk of potentially depegging and losing basically your, your, all your savings and, and whatnot, similar to you know a Terra Luna type situation, right? The whole issue there was that people were promised that this was a savings account and then it ended up just getting completely drained, right? So to piggyback off Thomas's point on the insurance piece, right, that's one mechanism of risk mitigation for stable coins. The other um, part of it is the di diversification, right? Um, the fact that you can create a stable coin with not just one asset, maybe a centralized asset or something like that, but a, diver um, a d diverse set of uh, tokenized assets as well. So both of those things kind of work hand in hand um in terms of the core differentiating factors of of what makes our tokens unique in this um you know heavily saturated world of stable coins i would say totally the um like the 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 fact that all erc20 tokens can be tokenized is uh, to me personally is the most the most uh, cool thing just because i i i I, I would bet money on it that in the in the near future we're going to see to assets tokenized that we didn't even think of yet that will create use cases for our tokens that we probably didn't think of yet uh, either. So so yeah, that's that's definitely a cool part. And then what I wanted to add on the insurance part is it's uh, it's one of the things that people have been most uh, most excited about to me personally uh, as a community man manager just because as you said, Soham these issues that have been happening so many hacks that we've seen and then and then, and then the depex uh, of a few stable coins so having having that insurance layer that you can check at all times on chain to know that it's safe um yeah i think that's a that's a big part and it's a, uh, to be honest i'm gonna i'm gonna uh, put out some of my stables in our tokens just because of that fact so um so yeah uh, I, I think uh, it's very clear those are the the main differentiators between uh, other stable coins and, and our tokens Okay, I wanna um, I wanna start diving into some uh, details of our plans for our token growth. Um, so um, I uh, believe you have uh, together with the rest of the team you've set up um, these plans. You were one of the main people that have worked on this. Um, if I rec recall correctly, you the way you describe our plans for our token growth is in three main pillars. Um, could you uh, talk a bit about the pillars and maybe give us an introduction or, or a detailed description about the first of the three pillars? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, the way we kind of thought about it in terms of the pillars, we really wanted to focus on how does technological adoption, particularly in the world of finance and, and currencies, usually happen and kind of map our growth trajectory to what we've seen kind of work in the past in this field, right? And it really kind of comes down to almost three, uh, three areas, I would say. One is kind of the innovation aspect. The second is kind of the early adopters, right? You see with, with any new technology, you have your early adopters who are really kind of working the kinks out and, and figuring out where the, the fit is. And then lastly is just kind of mass adoption, right? Um, and what you can think of is almost like retail adoption. And this is where you go from something that uh, you, you kind of look at the hockey stick curve, right? That a lot of people talk about in, in venture capital and in, in finance and in different industries. And this is really where you get that kind of hockey stick type curve. Um, so kind of going back to that first point of, uh, of innovation, right? So our, kind of our first pillar is going to be focused on our token creation. 
right? And so the goal here is really to one, raise awareness for reserve as a protocol and what our vision is in terms of helping people achieve stable currency and, and inflation. And two is to really target potential R token deployers that we think will will make great fits um, in terms of folks that are, are willing to kind of have that financial engineering, entrepreneurial uh, developer perspective and really deploy uh, our tokens because we're going to be putting out this platform that we're really excited about. But if no one ends up actually creating our tokens, then kind of what's the point, right? Um, in terms of how we're going to get there, right? We have a very detailed kind of marketing and, and PR strategy that, that we're laying out right now um, in kind of the, the month leading up to our launch. So very excited to be rolling that out social media side and things of that nature on, on the marketing front. Um, second is going to be really reaching out directly and, and connecting with people within the DeFi community, developers, financial engineers, people really uh, that we think could make uh, really interesting R token deployers and starting to have conversations with them, being aware of our protocol and kind of pitching them on, on uh, you know, the benefit that, that um, they could achieve just by you know deploying a very successful R token that ga gains a lot of adoption. And then the last kind of piece of this is kind of conferences and events. So we're going to be attending a lot of conferences this fall, also trying to you know, make connections with developers as well as uh, you know, other people in the DeFi community, really try to get our name out there and, and um, get people to basically be interested once the platform launches to, to deploy our tokens. So that's kind of a three-pronged approach, approach we're taking in this first R token creation phase. Um, hopefully that gives folks a little bit of context on, on what we're going for there. It does, it does, because um, we, we've made public publicly the decision that Reserve is creating the platform, not the R tokens themselves. So it only makes sense for Reserve to um, do the work, market the thing, to make sure that deployers do, um, do create R tokens. Um, Question about that for uh, Thomas and Nevin. Uh, let's start with Nevin. Um, Nevin, who do you think are the ideal candidates for creating R tokens? And uh, as a second question, has Reserve already talked with potential R token creators? Yeah. So um, in in the short term, I think. Um, basically, there's a category of people who are deep in DeFi. Uh, who are most like sort of most prepared to see the possibilities, right? If you're if you're very deep in DeFi, if you've done some amount of you know financial engineering within DeFi or capital allocation, or even if you're just like a really hardcore yield farmer uh, on your own, then you're familiar with the sort of long tail of different assets that exist, and you've probably had the experience of your friends or family being like, "Whoa, like what is that? How could I participate in that?" And maybe you try to explain it to them and you're like, okay, yeah, actually, it doesn't really make sense for you to do all this crazy stuff I'm doing. Um, if, you're, if you're someone in that position, um, then you can sort of see that with a reserve protocol, you could take what the very complicated things that you're doing to construct those positions and, uh, and package that into something that is accessible to a normal human. Um, and so we have had some conversations with uh, folks in the in the DeFi world that match that description. Uh, maybe maybe Thomas would want to comment on that in more detail because he's been sort of more engaged on that side, um, uh, or maybe Soham as well. But uh, so I think that basically, you know, DeFi uh, nerds are are sort of the uh, logical population of people to to start with this. I do think in the longer term, there's maybe more of an ideological uh, component. Like I, I personally foresee um, a community continuing to form and consolidate around the idea of creating non-fiat money. Um, and you know, we see some of that with Bitcoin and crypto overall, um, but there's a lot of bullshit. You know, there's like a lot of people sort of talking about the fall of the dollar, but it really they just want the price of their Bitcoin to go up and they're kind of just trying to shill. Um, but there, there are, you know, we, we've talked to, you know, many people reach out to us because they see our project's mission and they get, and they're excited by it. There are a contingent of people out there who, from an ideological perspective, would like to see the thing that we're ultimately driving towards happen in the world. And so I think that um, over the course of time, the profile of people making our tokens could change 
um, uh, sort of slowly to um, to a contention that's more ideologically focused, who maybe aren't necessarily doing it for the money, but doing it more for what it could cause in the world. I think that's exactly. Oh. I, and uh, the the biggest uh, group I'll add is an interesting in between group that is, I think. Um, they're basically seeing the Starbucks model and want to mimic it for their own their own business or ecosystem or whatever it is. Uh, and for th for those that aren't aware, Starbucks has like over a billion dollars in gift cards that are stored on their platform, um, and that, you know they're, they're able to make revenue from all of the capital that is held up there. Um, and, and it's an interesting uh, it's kind of an interesting metaphor or similarity here. I think I'm using the wrong comparison term there. Um, but, uh, but, but there's other businesses that also see this, uh, you know, see this platform as an opportunity to create a branded currency for their ecosystem, um, well, the, where they'll be able to participate in the upside. And we, we've had a, a few, um, we've had a bunch of conversations with folks that are interested in something like that. Um, and that group is like very broad. It, it might be, um, you know, someone with a crypto app. It might be someone, um, you know, like I mentioned last time, I, I spoke to a bank who's interested in it. I, there's a variety of different folks that are interested in this kind of thing. It could be uh, crypto games that don't want to watch their their game currency trend towards zero, like most of them do, um, and want to just focus on you know the assets and uh, the, the other parts of the game as opposed to that more complex part of the game economy that they make up. Um, so yeah, so it's an, another interesting segment. The two that uh, Nevin mentioned are definitely, you know, the beginning and the end groups, I would say. As a, as a side question, uh, Thomas, for you, um, the way that I think about our token deployers is um, I can see some, uh, Nevin called them these DeFi, DeFi nerds or whatever term he used, um, that want to experiment with the platform. I'm, I'm sure those will be there. Um, but if you, compare, if you compare those with potential, let's call them institutional R token deployers, um, these individuals will have less uh, capital or resources to effectively market or grow their R token themselves versus an institution or a company that can actually uh, put more and more resources on, on marketing and R token. Um, do you have an idea or, or, a, or a vision about what percentage of R token deployers is going to be uh, individuals versus uh, entity, let's call them companies? Um, and is there something that Reserve does for these individuals? Like, imagine an individual uh, deploying an R token, but them having no capital whatsoever to do any kind of marketing. Is there something Reserve does to help them boost or anyone else does to help them boost or any thoughts on that? Yes, yeah, so before we even get to the boosting part, it's kind of an interesting like philosophical question of what do people trust more, right? Like those, you know, Nevin was joking about Bitcoin, but there's like a beauty to Bitcoin in that no one knows who Satoshi is, right? And that it like is almost purely like a community grown thing. Um, and, you know, I, I could see a world where, you know, someone anonymously deploys an R token uh, and does it in a very decentralized, permissionless way. Um, and that in and of itself is valuable. Um, to the community and you know especially in the DeFi world uh you know we've seen that play out before um and so uh you know i, I could see a world where i could talk myself into thinking that that is like the one that will end up getting the uh being the most successful um but at the same time you know to your point like uh marketing matters and institutions can throw marketing dollars behind it and also funnel in existing use cases um, to make it easy for people to uh, to uh, you know obtain and use these things, um, and so uh, you know I think with the right teams that are launching them, that you know those could be very successful as well. Um, to the last part of the question around you know how we can help, uh, you know we've mentioned this a few times. We're trying to figure out our uh, what the best way to have our grant program is, but our, our goal is you know we've got a variety of resources um, internally. Uh, that we're aiming to help uh, people that use our platform use to grow. And so whether that's like expertise um, or, you know, voting power in uh, the Curve ecosystem or, 
um, you know, a variety of different things. Uh, we're aiming to help uh, assist folks that use our platform. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think I think I. Got yeah, that, answered, that does answer the question. And James just asked the same thing in in the general chat. He's asking. Uh, will there be any resources available for potential R token deployers? So I think the answer there is, James, uh, yes, the reserve will have a grant program, which we still have to officially announce, but we've been we've been mentioning it here and there already a few times. Um, but so, yeah, and, and that could be a lot of things. That could be we're, we're using a system where we allow free uh, applications. And also we have a, a list of proposals that we might we think might be good to fund uh, more on that later. But the short story is, yes. Uh, we we're here to support our token deployers uh, to help them uh, make them big. Those our tokens make them big, but the R tokens have to make sense, of course. If you're if you're gonna make a, a Ponzi R token, I'm not sure if that's even possible. But uh, there there will be some kind of um, vetting um, uh, process. I it, uh, yeah, what Sinatra, One thing that I uh, forgot to say is. Uh... I'm the, the DeFi nerds group. Uh, I, I I consider myself one of those. Uh, and I know that there's actually a, a couple on this call who I've been having some amazing conversations with in the uh, the R token brainstorm channel. Um, and so yeah, that that is a, that is a group that we're very uh, excited to collaborate with. Yeah, yeah. Also, for people that are uh, in here that haven't uh, visited that channel yet, you can find the R token brace some channel channel if you have ideas about R tokens discuss them with us and with the rest of the community there um, and then uh, and then uh, that can be a, a joint effort all right one thing uh, I want one, one thing I want to just just quickly interject with here is um, like I, I think one thing that is obviously super super important when creating something that's meant to be used on by a large population if you're not if it's not just like a hobbyist project is the branding um, and so by that, I mean the name that's picked for any given R token and uh, the visual representation of that R token. And I could, the thing is, I can easily imagine someone being like a, 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 you know, an intelligent financial engineer who comes up with a great idea and makes it happen. You know, maybe they're also a programmer or they get a programmer to help implement a collateral contract or whatever. Um, but then, you know, maybe they, maybe they're not very good at branding. And so... This is something that I think we need to facilitate within the community, uh, people who are good at branding um, and, and maybe us supplying some resources to help with that, um, to connect with those who are deploying things so that things, you know, it, it's like you sort of name something once and you choose the initial uh, graphical representation once, maybe you, maybe you pivot after a while, but it's best if you get it right at the beginning. And so I think assistance with naming and graphic design from us or, or just from people in the community um, is uh, is going to be actually a pretty important piece and something that I definitely have on my mind. Yeah, great point. Great point. Ryan Ryan says in general chat he's going to call his R token Bitcoin. <laughs> Not sure if that if that works for the marketing. Um, all right, let's get into um, into the next uh, pillar, uh, BD wise. Um, Soham, you so the first pillar is targeting our token creators, our token deployers. Um, can you talk us through the second big pillar of our token uh, BD plans, Soham? Absolutely, absolutely. So it's good that we you know touched on kind of that first uh, first aspect, which is really focused on innovation, getting good our tokens deployed, um, and things of that nature. Now we kind of move on to the second. Uh, second kind of uh, pillar that we were discussing, which really is focused on early adopters and, and getting adoption for our tokens, right? And we really see this as kind of a DeFi expansion kind of phase, right? Um, for everyone who's focused on uh, and, and familiar with, you know, kind of the crypto and DeFi world, this is really where a lot of uh, things you guys are familiar with are, are going to start to resonate, Right. Um, the goal here is to really partner with other projects in the DeFi space to increase utility for our tokens themselves once they've been created. Right. So anything from DEX listings and liquidity incentives on, let's say, um, you know, different decentralized exchanges or Curve or something like that for our, our tokens, uh, to getting listed on different uh, borrowing and lending protocols, Compound, Ave, you name it. We're going to be going after those types of partnerships. Um, also, just simple things like portfolio tracking integrations on like DBank and things like that, as well as educational content and partnerships. Um, you can think of 
pretty much anything that a DeFi user would would use, we are going to try to partner with those sorts of organizations to help increase the utility for our, our tokens. Data in, uh, analytics type integrations like a uh, Coin Market Cap, Coin Gecko, those are all things we're going to be uh, kind of going after, as well as uh, you know, kind of research partnerships as well. Um, to be able to kind of partner with like a Mazari or something like that would be really awesome uh, to have them do kind of research pieces on us, investment grade um, or institutional grade research on reserve protocol and our tokens would be phenomenal. So that's kind of our, you know, phase two almost in terms of our DeFi expansion plan. Um, hopefully get, that gives folks an idea of where we're going on, on that front once we actually have uh, some successful R tokens deployed. Yeah, it's, it, it, for me personally, it's very clear. If, if anyone is uh, has has questions about that, uh, feel free to put them in the general chat. Um, one one big thing hey, that you mentioned. Oh, Thomas, you want to add something? Yeah, the, um, I think so. Now that uh, one uh, another way to think about this is, you know, our our tokens. You know, the goal is for them to be a currency. And currencies are as useful as the things that you can do with it, right? And so um, we're aiming to partner with uh, other DeFi protocols to essentially like add features to the currency, right? And every new feature will make it more useful for someone else, right? And so, you know, whether that's being able to trade with it or being able to um, supply it as collateral or borrow it or whatever the things are, um, you know, think of all the money verbs, right? Um, and then DeFi comes up with some crazy ones like, leveraged yield farming and stuff like that, right? Um, but at the end of the day, like all of these DeFi partnerships are uh, really like features of things that you can do with the currency. And so, we'll, you know, we'll be uh, working with, we've already started a lot of conversations with different platforms. Um, we'll be, uh, you know, prioritizing these in terms of how helpful we think they'll be to people um, and how much we think they'll contribute to, you know, growth of the TVL. I have a question about that. Um, for for these other like protocols to integrate tokens, do you guys know how much it's how much it's like uh, kind of in fact governed by a small handful of people, and you like reach out and have personal conversations with them versus you know a, a bunch of token holders kind of have to be persuaded as a crowd to like democratically vote to add your thing? Like in practice, which which of those two do you think is like the dominant thing that we're going to have to pursue? I think it's going to range from one-on-one -on -one conversations to see that with key community members or team members of different things. Uh, some of these actually have BD teams um, can start the conversation with. And then others, you know, like Ave, for instance, is like put a proposal up, try to get people to vote for it, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. And, and so it's going to vary quite a bit depending on the protocol slash company slash team, whatever it is. Yeah, I completely and, and, agree. In the conversations I've had, it, it really depends on what entity you're trying to go after. Good example is Ave or Compound or something like that will be, which will inherently be more decentralized in nature versus some of the things we're looking into in terms of like getting listed on Coin Market Cap or Coin Gecko or some of these other data analytics platforms people might have heard of, like right. DeFi Pulse and things of that nature. It's mostly going to be just reaching out to their teams. Um, and, you know, kind of joining their communities, having conversations with them, um, explaining about our project and, and what we're trying to do, and then getting listed through kind of that mechanism. It, seem, it seems like for a lot of those kinds of things, uh, there's kind of just like basic criteria for the thing being real enough, and then they had just have a procedure to add it. Is that mm -hmm. like, do you guys think that's going to be true for like protocols as well, where it's like once there's certain market cap or certain liquidity or something then like it satisfies the checklist and th there'll kind of just be a process where people decide to add it or is it more that like these different communities are kind of guarding their their area and you have to like persuade them that it's a good idea and it's not just about like criteria what do you like do you guys know it's a from what i've seen so far it's a combination uh, and I, I think actually Ave's a great example because we just went through this with RSR, um, where it's persuade people on the on the forum, but then they do also have a checklist, um, right? That you know became evident. You know, I, I know Sinatra kind of figured this out of like, do you have X amount of liquidity? Is it uh, is it a contract that has like 
that can be shut down in any way. Like whatever the, the checklist is, they're starting to have a checklist. And I think it really depends on the maturity of the protocol itself. Uh, like in the beginning, there it's kind of like, what do we think will work? But you know, now uh, you know there's a variety of different protocols working with like risk management firms and things like that like you know gauntlet is one of the risk management firms for ave compound and a few other spots um where they're actually doing very in-depth um data analysis of w how will this affect the overall ecosystem um and then you know generates its own checklist of different uh different things and parameters that need to be hit um so it, it really varies uh depending on the thing and then there's other like zapper for instance like total other end of the spectrum it's write your own code <laughs> and figure out how it shows up. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, uh, everything Thomas said just hit the nail on the head. I completely agree. And then the one other thing I would kind of add to that is like different, um, you know, kind of different DeFi platforms and stuff like that have different ways to evaluate who is, I guess, going to be listed on there. And this kind of goes back to the TVL conversation that we were having before, where one of the main reasons I almost see as having TVL as a short term kind of growth metric and success metric is not only that it like, you know, benefits all the, you know, token holders and that sort of stuff and, and shows adoption for the protocol itself, but also it makes a lot of these conversations a lot easier, right? Um, the, yeah. the folks that are going to be looking for some sort of validation before listing you and stuff like that, having high TVL and, and having a growing TVL absolutely makes those sorts of, uh, you know, kind of business development conversations uh, easier from, from that standpoint. So that's the only thing I'll add there. Do you think, they, that, actually, they care, go ahead, do you think that they care whether the TVL is organic or not? Like if you, if you just like offer incentives and get some amount of TVL from those incentives, is that basically going to cause the same benefit as if the TVL had been organic or, or not? Hmm. It's an interesting question. I almost like go back to like what happened with Lido, right? It's like if the TVL gets high enough, it's impossible for anybody to even like ignore it, right? Right. And so no one really knows. I guess like most of it came organically for in in their standpoint, but it it gets to a point where it's like the protocol just becomes so big that like no one can ignore it almost. And I don't know if right. they're going to do that much digging in terms of like did this come organically or not. Um, I'm sure a lot of people will, will do their due diligence, but also there's a lot of people who will just take it at face value for what it is. So similar to kind of the, the overall theme of this, I feel like it's very dependent on the, on kind of the protocol you're, you're looking to partner with at that point. Yeah. I think different, different teams have different, um, uh, like levels of thoughtfulness, um, there, a few conversations we've had, people are, you know, definitely talking about like sticky TVL, right, or sticky capital, and avoiding the mercenary mm -hmm. capital, um, which I think is a real thing. And you know, you there's actually good examples of other stablecoin projects that have run into this problem, where their TVL went up to into the hundred millions and like into the high hundred millions, uh, like over a billion, and then uh, are you know now down to like 150. Um, and it was, you know, clearly very not sticky TVL. Uh, and yeah. so we'll, we'll have to, uh, you know, I think if we can demonstrate stickiness, um, at the end of the day, what a lot of the platforms care about is capital. You know, it's just like traditional finance. AUM is the thing that speaks, and people don't really care where that comes from because that capital is what allows them to do different things with it. Um, you know, the scale of the capital is more important to who owns it as long as it doesn't go away. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. I, um, I want to uh, make sure that we talk about the last uh, pillar. But before uh, we do that, one thing I want to touch on, because it's very important, and a lot of uh, people have been talking about it, even outside of, of our community. And that's, um, Soham, you mentioned the um, integration uh, with, uh, well, integration is might not be the right word, word but you talked about um, the uh, Curve ecosystem. And there's been some news um, um, spread around about Reserve Protocol entering the Curve Wars. Even recently, I think we were one of the 10 uh, largest uh, holders of uh, CVX. Uh, that's a convex token. Um, Thomas, um, there's there's been a lot of 
questions about what exactly that means uh, for the end user. So could you make it as easy as possible um, and, and talk about it in the, in the, from the perspective of the R token deployer or the R token user? What exactly does reserve participating in the curve wars mean? Sure. Um, let's see. So uh, it's actually related to the sticky capital question. Uh, in the DeFi world, there are um, a lot of folks, whether it's you know uh, like yield like individual yield farmers or even crypto hedge funds that are just searching for safe yield. And you know, one of the classic places to do that is on stable coin DEXs, where they deposit their, their funds into uh, an AMM pool, um, allow folks to trade in between those funds. Ideally, they you know, are not experiencing a permanent loss um, with those funds. Uh, and then you know, they're generating yield in the form of trading fees and token incentives, uh, which then they go sell for more stable coins. Um, and can return, you know, and can generate a return on their on their on their capital. Um, one of the main places to do that in the DeFi world is in the Curve Dex, uh, which is the second largest Dex outside of Uniswap. Uh, it's got a heavy focus on stable coins in particular. I mean, it's where a lot of stable coins um, begin their trading. Um, because it, you know, there's different ways to get yield. And so when you have voting power in the Curve ecosystem, uh, there's a set amount of Curve tokens that are emitted e each week, uh, or every two weeks, I believe. Um, and voting power determines which pools those tokens go to. And so by accumulating voting power, um, it, it makes it so that we can, direct, um, we can direct some of those Curve emissions every week to our token, um, pools and you know as a result people will see these pools and we'll see that there is a high yield um, available on those pools uh, and then you know we'll go obtain our tokens whether it's through minting or buying um, and deposit them into those pools and leave them there and you know it, in terms of like high level why we went with the strategy we went with there's I won't go too deep here but there's like 18 different ways <laughs> of getting involved here uh, and Nevin and I did a, a bunch of different analysis on the different ways and tried to figure out the best way for us to be able to uh, maintain and make to maintain that voting power and, and keep it as sticky as possible with the least amount of risk for us. Um, and so, you know, we ended up uh, settling on uh, obtaining these CVX tokens. Um, you know, there's like a renting versus buying type thing, and this is where it becomes uh, related to sticky TVL, um, where it's good to uh, own the voting power as opposed to buy the vote or rent the voting power um, because it means that you can keep the capital there longer, uh, keep those incentives longer uh, for folks to keep those funds deposited in the, uh, in the liquidity pools. Um, was that short and high level and clear enough, Sinatra? Let me recap and, and see if I got it. So um, from the perspective of an R token user, do I understand correctly that they just get a higher yield on their R token if they deposit it on the Curve liquidity pool. And on the perspective of the R token deployer, they get tons of liquidity uh, initially for their R token. Did I get that right? I think that's exactly right. Um, and we don't know exactly what those yield levels will be because it's dependent on how everyone else about every week. Um, but, you know, like you mentioned, we are now one of the larger uh, token holders of CVX. And so, um, you know, we can probably incentivize uh, higher yields on our pools compared to others. That's awesome. That's something that we from a community the, the risk is painfully obvious. Uh, it also will just make it so that our token holders or, or people who want to be our token holders can easily treat in and out of them on curve because mm -hmm. there will be significant liquidity. Yes, that, that's a really good point. Uh, the, the, the benefit of curve is that there's very low slippage trades for stable coins. And so um, it, it'll make it, you know, Curve is aggregated by one inch and Matcha and all these other uh, DeFi trading plat DeFi trading uh, aggregators. And so it, it'll be uh, seamless for folks to trade. In, you know. uh, and also for arbitrage uh, market makers to help maintain the peg. Um, you know, like 
we, we've spoken about this a bunch, but you know, our tokens will be fully collateralized. Um, but you know, folks will have to get the collateral, deposit it, um, et cetera. And so, uh, you know, in the case of anything like trading off, uh, we expect that the peg will be able to be very, very tight because there's deep liquidity for our tokens and they're fully collateralized. Makes sense. Awesome. I noticed we have um, five minutes left to the hour, and I do think we have to jump off uh, on the hour. So I want to make sure that we dive into this last uh, pillar uh, in our token growth. Um, Soham, could you introduce us to that last uh, uh, BD pillar? Yeah, absolutely. And this is, for me, kind of like the most exciting thing about the whole project, right, is um, you know, just the fact that it's, it's already set up so perfectly for this kind of last uh, last segment, which is kind of where you go after the mass adoption, the huge hockey stick growth, that sort of stuff. And then the the third kind of pillar for us is really going to be retail uh, expansion. And so, as you guys all probably know, we have the RPay app, which you know is currently uh, heavily used. I think we have like 650 or more thousand users on the app itself, as well as 25,000 plus merchants that are that are currently using the app. Um, and so this is really where we want to take everything that, uh, this is really going to be the time where we bridge together what's happening in kind of the protocol side and the uh, DeFi side and bridge it into, uh, making it accessible and usable for your everyday kind of customers through, uh, you know, a very, f uh, familiar app style, uh, front end interface almost. Right, so this is where we're going to take successful R tokens and integrate them actually into the R R Pay app. So anybody who would be able to download the app is now able to, you know, basically take their local currency wherever they may be and swap it and get exposure for these like successful R tokens. Right, you can almost imagine the same exact uh, process that's being used right now for RSV, which is our kind of prototype stablecoin being used in the same exact fashion for people to get access to successful R tokens, um, whatever those may be. Um, and still, you know, take advantage of all the benefits there in terms of, you know, the inflation protection, the, the revenue sharing, that sort of stuff. We're also going to be looking to, during this kind of phase, looking to expand to more uh, centralized finance type partnerships. So centralized exchanges getting listed on there, um, you know, your Coinbase's, your Binance's of the world, that's where this is really going to be uh, kind of like take foothold as well as just um, I know there's a bunch of different like crypto tax softwares. And so we're looking at potential integrations with those as well in this phase. So that kind of rounds it out. Um, yeah, happy to, to dive into it with the other folks, but that gives a, an overview of kind of our, our uh, final pillar there. Yeah, so you're talking about uh, the final pillar uh, you've been talking about is actually offering those art tokens to retail users outside of DeFi, right? Uh, also, just people like the the, the people that use the RP app right now that are not necessarily crypto savvy. Um, question about that, uh, maybe for you, Nevin. Um, what does our tokens integrated within the RP look like exactly? Will it just be a stable coin that might be insured? Um, would, are we thinking of bringing yield farming options through our tokens uh, to the RPA app? Uh, will we just integrate all our tokens or any any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the RPA team is definitely excited about being able to offer safe yield uh, to the existing user base and, and new users. So, um, you know, from from kind of the beginning of RPA, the idea was that eventually there would be the possibility to offer you know, something that kind of feels like a checking account versus savings account type distinction. Um, but it, uh, it's really going to be up to the RPA team uh, as our tokens get created and and we evaluate them and see which ones are catching on and make sense and so on and which ones get listed elsewhere. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of funny because, you know, RPA sort of is its own is its own uh, thing, uh, similar to how, you know, Coinbase is its own thing. Um, and so, uh, you know, they'll be basically making prioritization decisions about, you know, should we spend the time adding this new feature or should we integrate this, this R token? It's just going to be a, you know, one, of, one of the possibilities um, on the list. So, 
because of that, I can't say like, well, the plan is to exactly this and that and the other in such and such configuration. Um, but I think that the, you know, the basic idea is our tokens that offer value to people that are safe, that have yield or that have, um, you know, maybe less exposure to the dollar um, and more exposure to other things. Um, you know, if the, if the, our, if the uh, RPA user base wants them, if we, if we sense that there would be demand and we think that it, we're not putting them at any significant risk by offering them, then we will. That makes sense. I'm excited for, for the future to see what our tokens will be created and then integrated within, within RPA. I think um, we do have to jump off. We've reached the end of the of the of the call. Um, I know there's a lot of people asked questions in the general chat. I'm sorry for us not answering those uh, right now. Um, we'll make sure uh, us on the community team will make sure that the next event we'll do is a Q&A so that we can answer any uh, questions that you uh, might have. Um, for everyone that was here, thank you so much for joining. The session is recorded, so you can always uh, re-listen to it afterwards. Um, and to you, Thomas, uh, Soham, and Nevin, uh, also thank you so much for sh sharing your thoughts and uh, glad to talk to you on uh, on uh, next occasion. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks for organizing. See you guys. Take care.